You're taking me to exactly what I've been underscoring and is frankly very concerning in the rhetoric we are seeing at this hour already. We are seeing some Republican lawmakers come out with statements directly drawing a line between the shooter, whose name we do not know, we do not know if he's a lone actor or with somebody else, but drawing some connection to the government. We have nothing to base that on at this hour. But this kind of rhetoric has a nexus to violence. We saw that on January 6th. We saw that in the attack against Nancy Pelosi's husband and multiple other instances. This is why Americans don't like the media. How are we supposed to stop this from happening again if this is the message being broadcast to the nation? Former Attorney General Bill Barr joins me now. We don't know the motivation of the shooter. We know the shooter wanted Trump dead. We know that. But why can the media call Trump a Nazi who's going to imprison all of their children and expect everybody to all say, oh, you know, is this a both sides deal? Yeah, I think this trying to pin down the precise motive and how much it, how much of it was mental imbalance or emotional imbalance and how much of it was political is a bit of a fool's errand. There's a mixture of things there. And the bottom line, I think, is that when someone is demonized to the extent that Trump was being demonized, you're putting a target on them and you're increasing the risk that they are going to become a target for someone uh, who has a mixture of these uh, of these factors, you know, imbalance, some potential political element to it. They become the target. And what was concerning me uh, was that, uh, and, I, and I understand both sides, you know, the people on both sides that engage in extreme rhetoric uh, occasionally, but what was bothering me was that the thrust of the Democratic narrative for this election year had become that trust was a mortal danger to our democracy. And if he wins, the country's going away. And when you take that position, uh, you know, that is an apocalyptic and hysterical position that's bound to uh, lead to, uh, the, you know, violence eventually. Do you uh, see the Democrats? Combine that with the personal Attorney demonization. General, do you, Mr. Attorney General, do you see the Democrats scaling back that language? Because that, as you said, was the cornerstone of Biden's reelection strategy. Right. And, and, and you know, the, the, the sentiments expressed by the president in his remarks just now were very noble, and I hope they follow them, because if they believe it, they will scale back the rhetoric. And, uh, and what he said about, you know, differences in policy, uh, fine. You can attack your adversaries, you can attack their character and their policies and so forth, uh, but they demonized him, calling him Adolf Hitler, a racist, uh, a, a, and a fascist and so forth. It's ridiculous. He's not uh, the threat to democracy that they portray. He was president for four years, and he carried out excellent policies, and it was all done lawfully. This is the way they motivate their base, though, is by electrifying them with these venomous smears about being a dictator, about the bloodbath hoax, about him just shredding the Constitution and staying in the Oval Office until the end. How else are they going to motivate Democrat voters if they don't have this? This is the key page in the playbook. I don't, I don't think it's possible. I could see the next, I could see by August they're back to the same garbage. Well, that was my perception of why we suddenly saw this increase in attacks uh, and, and, and the decibel level and, and the vitriol increased is because they didn't have an alternative other than uh, this apocalyptic vision they're trying to paint. And by the way, it, it's not just about Trump. I, we've seen the same thing with the Supreme Court, the personal vilification. Uh, of uh, Supreme Court justices when they disagree with the Supreme Court justices on legal matters. And you know, the I'm glad you that mentioned that. I'm so glad you mentioned that because when Biden was talking about the Pelosi hammer attack in January 6 and the Whitmer kidnapping, he didn't mention the guy that showed up to Kavanaugh's house with the rifle. He didn't mention the Steve Scalise shooting. I mean, those were much more serious than some of these other things he mentioned. But you were the attorney general twice. They're launching this investigation. The FBI is in charge. Do you trust this FBI to do a clean investigation? 
I, I, you know, I, I think they should be given the chance to do the investigation, and but I think Congress will be watching every step and do their own investigation. Uh, and I think there's a lot to investigate. Uh, you know, I think those Secret Service agents on the detail, there's no question in my mind that they're loyal and brave and that they would take a bullet for, the, uh, for President Trump. Uh, but there was obvious screws, screw ups there that have to be uh, looked at carefully. And then I, I agree with your guest, Corey, that I think not only in the Secret Service, but in other law enforcement agencies, this, this, this DEI agenda uh, is, is, is uh, and the destruction of meritocracy is affecting the competence levels uh, of these agencies. And quickly, would you fire the Secret Service Director Cheadle? I would, I would fire her simply for having a tin ear and not coming out and being visible and saying something. Even if we don't know the story, I think it's still important to start the discussion and the transparency with the American people. And the way they handled today by trying to just brief Milwaukee and not saying anything about it was so ham-handed that I would fire her just for not understanding how uh, the responsibility of government officials uh, to, to interact with the public. All right. I would, too. Mr. Attorney General, thank you so much. Thanks. Click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You won't get it anywhere else.